welcome everyone to our workshop. <laughs> um, the first one uh, was a one hour session that we had last week and I'll just summarize um, kind of what we discussed there. Um, what came out of that was that there was not a specific location or site or concept um, that um, uh, the stakeholders in duress wanted to implement, but there were a few and there were a few options that they were looking into. Um, one of them, uh, the possibilities was the public library, the youth center and the um, NGO center. And in terms of the um, various research projects that we've done and um, organizations that we've worked with as Utropian, um, they especially found the Farg Fabric, the uh, Kaskina Roca Franca, Lago Residencias and the Market Hall in Bratislava of um, importance uh, because they thought that um, those had a resemblance with what they wanted to do. Um, as well um, on the ground in Duras. Uh, so what we've done after our uh, meeting is that we got together and we, some, we kind of collected the various case studies of various examples that could perhaps um, help guide you on the ground as to what the possibilities are, whether it be in terms of governance models, policy models, or structures, et cetera, uh, concepts, um, different uses of buildings, um, uses of space, etc. So um, we have a series of examples, uh, which we will uh, be running through, um, and uh, we'll, we'll um, kind of present them to you. So just let me, let's see, I'm going to add a few co-hosts here. Um, David and Bahanur, I've made you co-hosts as well. Okay, so I guess we can start. Um, we have pr prepared a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Is and another person, uh, mm -hmm. Borai, or you? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I see that a few people are trying to join and I'm just accepting them. Okay, so um, let's move on. I'll, I'll share the screen here of the PowerPoint presentation that we have. Here we go. All right. So, yep, so as we said, um, we are gonna um, go over the case study, the various case studies. The ones that we selected was the Largo Residencias in Lisbon, the Stara Ternitska in, in uh, Bratislava, the Kaskina Roca Franca in Turin, the Ferg Fabriken um, in Stockholm, as well as a few other unique examples, such as the um, Frauens Museum uh, the Gecko project that we are highly involved in, as well as the Agora project that, that we are involved in. So without further ado, I'll just get going on the Largo Residencias. You see the photo here. How is, is uh, you can see the, um, the presentation, right? Everything is fine, I hope. Um, yeah, so we visited there for a case study and uh, Largo Residencias is also something that we've been following for a while now. Um, it's a gorgeous building located in Intendant in the Intendant District of, of Portugal. Um, it was pretty run down before um, the cooperative took over and they invested heavily into it and revitalized the building and found alternative uses for it. Here's a timeline of how the Largo Residencias, um, kind of its history, it was founded in the 1850s um, as a residency of a family. And it went through a bunch of changes and we're gonna go over the changes that it went through, but um, most recently before it was taken over by, um, by the cooperative, it was even used as a brothel uh, at one point. Um, but what they did is um, they created together with help from various programs, which we will get into. And um, they invested into the building and they created new uses for it. And they created a structure which is very interesting, which combines commercial use with social programs with artistic endeavors. Um, now, one of the things that they have in terms of the activities, if we go into them, this, this here, this is a photo of the cafe, which is on the ground floor. Um, at the, in the cafe, they, they also employ people who have had it kind of difficult, um, locals especially from the area, um, minorities, uh, underprivileged uh, people, et cetera, they employ, um, them and offer them uh, uh, opportunities of employment. Um, it's also a cafe that serves as a social hub and it serves as an extension of the, um, of, of, of the cooperative, of the initiative. 
So when you go in there, you're not required to purchase anything. You can just sit around. Um, it also helps the people from the initiative sit around and get to know the locals as well to kind of feel what's happening in the neighborhood and what the neighborhood's needs are and what the locals' needs are, et cetera, and to establish contact with them uh, for further initiatives later on. Um, it's a four-story building um, that serves a multi-purpose uh, use. Uh, like I said, uh, social, the cultural, and the commercial functions all are within this building. Um, so what are the commercial functions? Uh, the commercial functions is that it serves as a hostel, basically, with private rooms as well as shared, uh, with private rooms mostly, uh, for tourists. And this is kind of, um, before the, the crisis hit, it was highly in demand because it was in the center of Lisbon. Um, and tourists would rent it through various platforms, and um, they would stay there. Um, the cafe, as I said, is also a commercial and social venture. It, it serves as a meeting point for the locals as well. And then it has a venue for artists and it also has artists in residency. So the artists in residency is also an interesting concept uh, where um, artists come, they, they stay there for a few months, they engage with the locals and the neighborhood and they create projects that invigorate uh, the neighborhood, artistic projects, shows, exhibitions, etc. And there used to be an intendant um, in, in the Largo Square, as well as in, in the surrounding area, a whole bunch of studios and um, Largo Residence has worked with those artistic studios to offer places for exhibition for the artists in residence. Um, there's also a bike shop on the ground level, which was very interesting. I, I met some interesting people there uh, upon our visit. Um, so what has, what was the community involvement of the Largo Residence? Yes, I'm just running through this because we have a few examples and we want to leave some time for questions. Um, afterwards as well. Um, so Intendant was a pretty bad neighborhood. It was run down. Um, there was um, lots of drugs and prostitution going on. Um, so what they did is they reached out to the local residents um, and they kind of activated the area. They found out who the main stakeholders were in the whole neighborhood and they reached out with them and they established contacts with them to create something jointly um, together. And in the beginning, of course, it was kind of they weren't. They were not met with enthusiasm per se. Let's say because they were, uh, the locals had to get to know them. But over time, the locals realized that they meant well and that they really wanted to help out the neighborhood, and so they established some uh, good relationships, um, where they uh, empowered the locals and they worked together with the locals. Um, so this bottom-up approach to urban uh, rehabilitation basically changed the square. Um, it's kind of created, it, it gave it, it, it reshaped the neighborhood and allowed for other um, more inclusive practices, et cetera, to kind of converge into the area and support uh, their, their um, what they were, their undertakings. Um, in terms of the policies, because I mean, th that's one thing, right? You have a group of people who are trying to, uh, to, to initiate change, who are investing in a building, who are creating a community center, who are establishing contacts with locals, who are engaged with artistic endeavors, who organize festivals and street festivals and cooking festivals, et cetera, with the locals. Um, but the policies also have to support this. And I think this is very important here. Um, the BIPSIP program, which Dani is also uh, heavily involved in, um, kind of what this is, is this is a very unique program. It mapped out the social inequalities and infrastructure issues uh, within Lisbon and various Lisbon, uh, the districts of, of, of the city. And um, what this helped do is it helped them kind of pinpoint where the issue points were and what partnerships could be established and which organizations could be worked with to help invigorate those um, kind of less fortunate areas or in, uh, locations that were unequal or did not have equal access or that had infrastructure issues, um, environmental irregularities, et cetera. Um, so this is one program that was highly effective. Um, the community that local development program is also the European, um, was created by the European Union through European Union, which also kind of provided them with instruments. Um, and then there were the local coordination offices um, that provided a framework that involved the municipality, the local bor boroughs and the relevant stakeholders, as well as community organizations to kind of get together to, to find ways or means of collaboration, collaborating. Um, and moving the decision making down to the local scare, scale as opposed to uh, the, uh, from, from, from above uh, decision making 
happened from bot uh, bottom up or kind of supported it, let's say it promoted that. In terms of the governance model of uh, the Lago Residencias, um, it's a cooperative. So what it means is there are stakeholders involved and every stakeholder has an equal say. The stakeholders either contribute with, with money, financial contributions, or they um, through work. So for instance, we interviewed while we were there, the, um, the architect, and they contributed a tremendous amount of time and effort into um, recreating or uh, reinvigorating and rebuilding uh, the site. Um, and everybody, uh, decisions are made jointly and everybody has an equal say. So it's a basic cooperative. And these kind of cooperative models, we've come across in various areas around Europe as well. And uh, perhaps it could be one of particular interest to Duras in, in Duras in, in the projects that uh, you'd like to be engaged in. Um, what do we say? Yeah, the democratic decision-making process was a part of this cooperative model. Um, the economic model is also very unique in that it combines the commercial revenues, which comes from the hostel and the hotel. And through these commercial revenues, it supports artistic projects, it supports cultural projects, and it also covers the workers' wages. So in terms of the workers' wages, we have the cafe, which is functional. We have the um, hotel and the hostel, which is functional. And um, the people employed here are paid through uh, the revenues that are gained um, through the um, hostel and hotel enterprise. Um, plus, of course, there's rent, which is the main expense, around 6,000 euros. Uh, they do have an issue with the um, building's owner because what happened is, and we come across this, and this is also a, a, perhaps a separate uh, topic that, that could be um, kind of um, debated, but the, um, what happens is gentrification is kind of promoted when you have um, you know, the rejuvenation of a building and an improvement in an area. And that's exactly what's happening with Largo and the Largo Square uh, and Intendent, the neighborhood overall, and the building prices are going up, rental prices are going up, and it's becoming even more difficult to maintain this, this model <laughs> because the prices are going up. So that is the Largo model. Now we're moving on to the Stara Ternitska, which is a market hall. And um, Bahano, was it you who's gonna be presenting the Stara Ternitska? Yes. <laughs> Very simple. Yes. Um, Stara Tushnika is very difficult for me to say. It's um, in Bratislava. It's just a one hour ride from Vienna and um, has an interesting story because um, it was built to be a market hall. Uh, back in time in 1910, people would um, go to markets <laughs> to obtain their food and all the uh, all similar things and the market model is a little bit um, not so popular anymore we prefer to go to supermarkets we go to shopping malls and so on and actually Daniela uh, and Utropian have a publication about markets in our times how they struggle so it's it's a it's a dear topic for us um, the markets um, and the markets were, uh, was running as a market, then it was empty. 1989, it uh, was empty, then the municipality launched renovation, people. Um, the building became vacant because there was not so much interest anymore from, uh, from the public in, in Bratislava to shop um, in the market and potentially, uh, the market stalls were also not so innovative, let's say. And um, there was a, a group of people in 2016, which um, founded the Old Market Hall Alliance. They uh, took over the market and um, the market is running again, uh, is a venue for many, many activities. And we will uh, shortly explain how the mix works, how the financial model works, and how this, um, this, this mix made, made a change. So this is a picture from the market, how uh, the interior is. You have this big hole 
uh, where you can have the market as in this situation, but you can have also a lot of other activities because it's very big. You can use it for events, festivals, conferences, workshops, and so on. So on the sides, you have the two store, uh, stores uh, and in the middle, you have a big hall. <clears throat> so the, during the week, the building serves a as a concert hall or a ballroom or conference hall uh, and so on. But on Saturdays, which would make much, much, much more rent price, on Saturdays, they reserved uh, the, the building as a food market. So the picture we saw happens every Saturday. And despite, they would get much, much more rent if they would do the other way around. Um, then the you have the cafes, bike, uh, bike sharing places, and restaurant, wine bar, and so on and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So you have as a, as a central uh, point uh, the cooperation, which organizes all the arc, uh, activities in the market hall. Um, they have regular meetings with all the tenants to focus on cooperation and how they can benefit uh, each other. They do collaborative projects um, with the tenants and also events. And um, they started as an association to make sure that they uh, work for the public interest. Uh, next slide. So. Also in this case, um, we have a, um, we have a policy behind which made this project uh, possible. Gabor Binditz is one of the persons who run the place, and he said in our interview, municipalities are structured in a regular a regulatory way. The market hall gives a, pre a precedent to these structures in how to work with innovative proposals coming from the outside, meaning. Because they have the collaboration with the municipality and uh, a kind of the, the structure with the association and involving new business models and so on, they can reinvent, which we want from all businesses uh, today, they can reinvent, adapt to the situation, adapt to the market and be much faster than the municipality can be, but also be more sustainable, look uh, for own interests so that they can sustain their business, but also react to the, um, uh, to the needs of the citizens, uh, the community. So the governance model is, as I said, uh, NGO. It's, uh, it was founded as an alliance of um, four thinkers. <clears throat> it uh, identifies itself as a social enterprise. So they are not uh, interested in paying dividends to the to the uh, to the people involved in the association. The money, the 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 profit goes again in activities and <clears throat> social um, uh, um, uh, businesses. Um, and their scheme is also very interesting. Um, they pay to the municipality one euro rent per year. So they have a rent contract with the municipality. So all the duties and so on are defined in this contract. Um, and as a condition, the Alliance has to invest 10,000 euros in the renovation, maintenance and so on of the market hall. So basically, the city has uh, given the duty to renovate, to keep, to maintain um, this building to the alliance. And the alliance has only the obligation to, to keep the building. And they can do all the activities they, uh, they want to, to make sure that they can um, invent, uh, invest 10,000 euros into the building. And their revenues come from the marketing uh, cooperation, from rentals and from large events. And uh, it was in the first slide, uh, we missed the point. They, um, yes, this one. They started the activities in, in 2012 and um, 2012 and 2017 in five years, 
they were break even with the investments into the building. So that shows in only five years, even if you are totally social, have no profits out and uh, allow people to, to uh, create places for their own needs, you can be um, financially reliable and um, also renovate a building within five years. That's um, a good example how to do things. And um, by the way, the person who initiated um, or one of the persons who initiated this whole alliance, Matus Valla, uh, became a um, mayor in 2018. And we were by luck there to shoot our documentary. And it was, it was you had this, this connection from community, the future uh, mayor. And I think this is a very inspiring uh, story, uh, which could, uh, which would be very, very beautiful to be replicated in, uh, in Albania. Thank you. Yes, I, I recall uh, when we were there shooting at the documentary, it was a big deal, you know, the, one of the founders becoming the mayor. Um, I think it was the election cycle at that point. He was not elected yet, if I recall correctly. Um, this, the next uh, case study is the Cascina Roca Franca in beautiful Turin, which I had the pleasure of visiting as well. And um, our resident English-Italian, Daniela Patti, will tell us more yes. about this case. So, yeah, I think this it's not Kashina. Kashina, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good. Miro has a very, very good Italian pronunciation. So some of our members in the team are, 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 are working on their Italian, but there's too many languages. So already Albanians most of them... speak, Danny, Albanians speak pretty good Italian because they, yeah. uh, they receive uh, Italian TV. TV yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm afraid that I can't say that I, uh, I, do, I do the same. I'm very sorry. I don't speak any Albanian <laughs> whatsoever, but hopefully we'll come to visit you and I'll pick up some next time. Let's For see. sure. <laughs> so the, the Kashin, I think it's an interesting transition also of what we were talking about, the political support, because we see also how a lot of these, uh, a lot of these initiatives, uh, there is a big difference when you see that there is a, 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 a political dimension to, uh, to the whole work. So we're in Turin. And what happens is the Kashina, Kashina means a, a country house. So it's in what today would be a periphery of the city of Turin. Um, Turin, basically, you might all know Fiat. Okay, so Turin is the city where there was the industries of the production of Fiat. And this was the wealth of the city. As in the many cases back in the, in the 1970s, let's say 90, late 1970s, early 1980s, there started being a, a crisis of the car industry, which meant that the, uh, that the fiat industries slowly started reducing the number of people that were needed, uh, all the workers that were needed. And this created also a lot of riots. Uh, this also meant that the neighborhood Mirafiori, which was the neighborhood where most of the workers of the Fiat were actually living, uh, started living in a neighborhood with a very high unemployment rate, a lot of delinquency problems, because obviously a lot of the people were not working with, with all the problems that uh, came from that. So what happened was in the late 1990s, the municipality launched uh, a process that was uh, connected to the, the regeneration of the, um, of the Mirafiori neighborhood, as part of a whole uh, regeneration of the peripheral neighborhoods of the city of Turin. This was also launched within a, uh, an EU program that was called Urban, which were large investments for urban regeneration. This program no longer exists in that sense, but at the time there were very large investments for physical, especially physical regeneration. So, you know, buildings, creating infrastructures and so on. And this was done within a, in a, the city of Turin um, was renowned for also having a very strong uh, left-wing um, uh, politics, which meant that they invested a lot in having participation of local inhabitants uh, and uh, involvement of the local stakeholders. This I say because then what happened was that to regenerate the Mirafiori neighborhood, uh, what was done was that they started um, uh, having a lot of uh, tables of, of participation with a lot of the local stakeholders in the neighborhood. And here comes the role of the Kashina. What came out of the, of the discussion with the local stakeholders is that it would be very important to have 
a cultural center, a space for a community. And so here in the image, you see uh, the Kashina. So the Kashina was a, a country house of the 1600s that was then re renovated with, you know, very good environmental standards. You see some very beautiful facades. You see that it has a beautiful courtyard. And today it has very interesting functions because it hosts in its courtyard a series of uh, temporary activities like the market that you say there. But what is most important is that it has permanent activities within it. Um, so there's hundreds of activities every year that are done in collaboration with the associations of the neighborhood. And these are from cultural activities such as music, theater, because there is, there is a conference uh, theater hall for approximately 100 pe uh, people. This was numbers in pre-COVID before social distancing. Um, there are a series of cultural activities like language courses, also for foreigners, because nowadays there's a large uh, number of foreigners living uh, in the neighborhood, but also activities with children, with elderly people, with um, pe disabled people, um, uh, women, any marginalized group, let's say, has a, the opportunity of having activities and being involved in this, uh, in this space. Um, if I can ask for the next slide, thank you, thank you. What is very interesting here, and this is also what we were talking, is when we see that these regeneration projects are done also with a strong political backup of the municipality. Uh, so this could be something also interesting to consider in uh, the city of Dures, because what we see here is that in the late 1990s, there was the tavoli sociali, so the tables, the social tables, these were the participatory processes. And what was done was that it really was trying to get on board as many people from formal and informal organizations. So it meant like social workers, school teachers, people working in the living in the neighborhood, trying to get as many people on board to discuss together and brainstorm about what would be the ideas. And this is how they could then create um, a critical mass of people that were actually engaged in the project of the Kashina and would be supporting it. So what happens at this point is that we see, if I can ask for the next slide, thank you, is that the, the, um, the uh, here you see a, a, an, interesting, uh, an interesting quote from, uh, from one of the people, Renato Bergamin, who is one of the people that were, are uh, running the, the Kashina. And, and this is really the idea at the core of the Kashina. And I think we understand that this is the idea that you have of your cultural, your cultural center, is that it's really an open space that can be used by the inhabitants, the NGOs and the stakeholders to run their activities. Uh, next, please. So how do we do this? Obviously, each country, you know better than me, is, 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 um, has a very difficult, different policy framework to be developing. What is interesting here is that this project came out of what I was talking about. First, the Progetto delle Periferie, so the periphery project that was, in, that was basically investing in the peripheries. And then in the early 2000s, it was with the Urban program, this European program. And then very recently, there were also other European programs. This is why I say, because obviously, regenerating the Kashina with, you know, high environmental standards, good quality of space, creating all this public infrastructure and so on is a financial investment. And to be doing this uh, with such a strong commitment to the social cause means that usually this investment has to be done by public. This in the case of Turin, on the other hand, it could be an open discussion with you if you think that maybe there are some private uh, organizations, some banks that might be will or some companies that might be interested in corporate social responsibility investment or something to, to invest in, in your museum. And the last and the next, sorry, and then here is then what we're talking about the governance. And this is, I think, a very interesting thing that is connected, obviously, to the policy and the finances that we were dis discussing. So Cascina Rocca Franca, the building is owned by the municipality. But there is a foundation that manages the activities. And this is a public-private foundation. This means that it is participated by the public administration, but also by other NGOs and organizations that are um, involved in the activities of the Kashina. Um, and also what is, uh, what is uh, relevant is to see that the Kashina Rocca Franca has as a, uh, as a mission to keep a social and cultural purpose. 
Um, this means that it cannot do commercial activities per se. At the end of the year, it cannot have profit. It always has to reinvest any income into the activities. And this brings us to the last slide. Might have been a bit long. Apologies if I got too much into details, but it's, I think, a very interesting case also for, uh, for you. Maybe it can be a nice inspiration. Um, the economic model that we were talking, the Cascina Rocca Franca is autonomous in its financial management. This means that the foundation decides how to invest its money. Um, its yearly expenses are approximately 200 to 150,000 euro. It's quite a lot. This includes wages for all the people that are working there, taxes, safety regulation, organization and services uh, for the events and so on. And then the revenues are approximately 2, uh, 250,000 euro. This means that it is approximately self-sufficient because by offering spaces and activities and the cafeteria that is a social enterprise as well, which uh, um, gives the work to uh, disabled, mentally disabled people, um, this means that the, the, um, that the uh, that the activities within the foundation are self-sufficient. Obviously, this was only possible now that it has been existing for so many years. Um, it was not absolutely like this at the beginning. So this is also something when we look at the business model of these initiatives and these spaces is that it probably will not be possible for them to be self-sufficient from the very, very beginning. And I think this is a nice transition then going moving over to the Farg uh, Fabriken, I believe. Thanks. Thank you, Dani. Yeah, um, the Farg Fabriken is also a big building. <laughs> I don't know which one's bigger. I think the compound of Kashina is a bit bigger, the, but the fire fabrican is a huge place because it used to be a factory. And um, when we look here uh, into its history, the building was built in 1889 um, to accommodate the production of paint. And, um, you know, it, it produced paint and it's located in, a, in an area in, in, of Stockholm that used to be the periphery, that used to be the industrial center. There's a river going there. You used to have ships bringing in industrial supplies in and out. And still to this day, you do sometimes, there's still a few um, industrial sites left, though it's slowly changing. And Far Far Beacon has kind of been a locomotive of that change in the, in the area. We'll get into that. So what happened is that um, it stopped the production of paint. The paint factory stopped producing paint and the um, building was left. And at one point it was just, there was a tree growing inside of it. There was no um, roof in the building, the infrastructure of the building started um, becoming quite decrepit. And um, the, um, a few organizations, including the architecture um, organization of Stockholm, uh, got interested in it and they decided to kind of, and of course the board of the paint factory and the owner of the paint factory wanted to find a new use for it. So um, what they did is um, they found a new use and they decided to create a bit an art center that, but it's a very unique art center that combines um, um, urban planning and art architecture issues with self-expression. Um, the renovations were done and um, exhibitions started taking place. And um, the exhibitions were always um, a result of a process, which we will get into. So it wasn't like just this artistic exhibition. It was um, the result of various stakeholders and various people who normally, and there's even a method called the Fire Fire method now, which is kind of, you know, a well-known method that brought together people of different um, um, uh, backgrounds that normally would not get together and had them converge and kind of discuss issues. And these are what the exhibitions came out of. So, you know, it, 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 it is serving a very unique purpose, the, the Fire Fire Beacon in that regard. Um, which brings us into the activities. Um, yeah, it hosts events, it hosts workshops, it hosts exhibitions, of course. But these exhibitions are not uh, are around very societal issues, urban planning issues, um, historical issues, etc. cetera. Um, it's basically about all the topics that are relevant um, to the context of, um, of the Hoyman, of, um, of um, the, the district that it's located in, as well as, as Stockholm at large. Um, and art in this sense is being used as a context um, to kind of stimulate discussion and liberate ideas and allow people to engage more with, with um, the issues at stake. It also has a shop within it. It has an event space on the second floor. It's gorgeous. Um, that's also run. And um, it has a cafe. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because when we were interviewing uh, one of the founders, he said that um, 
a lot of people know Far Far Beacon from the parties that take place over the weekends, and they don't, they don't, they didn't even know that it was an art center. <laughs> they find out later. Um, so there's a lot of collaborations with local initiatives. Um, you know, uh, while I was there, I saw that there was a cement factory right next to it, and right next to the cement factory was uh, an art artist initiative that that was creating, um, you know, sculptures out of cement and clay. Um, it also serves as a gathering point. It collects knowledge about the area. It maps the local actors. It builds networks among them. So it's a very unique space. Um, and basically, like I said, the Fra Fra Beacon method allows uh, for it to be a space that's dedicated to um, discussion where opinions, ideas, feedback, they're collected, they're disseminated, et cetera. And uh, the products of local artists are also sold. There's a, a lot of initiatives in the area, thanks to Fire Fire Beacon being there, who've also kind of converged in the same area. And there's a lot of interaction going on. Um, yeah, it's um, it's an autonomous, it's in an autonomous, it's a more autonomous setting. It um, sets its own agenda. So in that regard, it's kind of different than the state-owned and funded cultural centers. Um, and yeah, the policy is that it is a place of free expression um, and it does not affiliate itself with any political or religious ideology or any affiliation of any sort. Um, it's open basically for discussion, um, but it does receive regular funding from Stockholm to help support um, the initiatives that it undertakes. The governor's model is a unique one because it's a unique case. You know, the building is owned by the faint paint factory. And then a lot of investment had to go in into renovating the building. And then there's the architecture center that's also involved. And so what happened is they created a board and the board oversees the functions, but there's also a management that's separate from the board. And the board is not hands-on. It, it basically serves as um, a consultancy. It helps guide them. It helps draw the connections. Um, but it does not kind of pass on what it wants to be done. The management of the Fire Fire Beacon takes care of those issues. Um, the board is more concerned with the financial side of the organization. Um, it's the staff that, that defines the um, agenda. Um, there's two unique organizations that's within the building. Um, there's a cultural organization, which has an exhibition hall, which is huge. Um, but there's also an events organization that manages the restaurant and other commercial events, such as what I just described to you, the parties that take place there and that uses the location. Um, so the economic model is also a combination thus of private engagement and public funding. The Linden Group, in which is um, one of the main sponsors, contributes to um, almost 300,000 a year to the organization, which covers the cost of the um, the events taking place as well as the uh, the wages. Um, a huge part of the foundation's budget is linked to grants and sponsorships. And then, you know, there's also public grants coming in from government and EU funds that support the economic model of Fire Pro Beacon. Um, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, uh, just to summarize, it's a very unique kind of model because the um, building is privately owned. So the board kind of serves a very unique function but um, what they have done really well is kind of separated the board and the demands of the board from the organization that kind of self-sustains and runs itself and without interference from the board, which I found to be very interesting. Which brings us over to the Frauen Museum. And I believe Bahanur will be telling us more about that. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, this, this museum is in Hittisau and looks like this. It's not a heritage building, uh, but it has elements, historic, traditional building techniques and so on. Um, unfortunately, Yilmaz, you don't have my uh, presentation with the additional slides. Anyway, um, I wanted to um, include this case, even though it's very small and it's in the middle of nowhere. I don't know if any of you heard of Hitizau. It's somewhere in the mountains in the furthest place to, uh, to Vienna in the, at the border to Swiss, Switzerland. And um, it's an area which was 100 years ago, very good populated. There, there, there were some small workshops and so on who produced uh, local um, products and so on. 
but after the regulation of the Danube River, uh, these mountain villages lost all their uh, importance. So they are in, in seasons important uh, to host a few guests, but it's not a touristic region not too much. It has a little bit um, this this uh, summer um, tourists who walk around or who go hiking and so on in winter if there is snow a little bit uh, uh, skiing and so on. But it the traditional meaning of the village is totally lost uh, of being a sustainable region uh, connection of villages in the mountain and so on. And um, the next city access to uh, to this uh, space, it takes 40 minutes to the next city, which is has only 30,000 um, inhabitants. And uh, from that city to the next airport in Zurich, you would need one and a half hours. So it's not the best place to start a museum. Um, but this one is special because they didn't just make a museum by itself, it was meant to be uh, for and about women. And that puts Hittisau and the museum and the community on the landscape. The, the museum is for people who are related, interested, uh, known in Middle Europe, a lot of universities, um, artists and so on want to exhibit there, do, the, uh, do events there. It's not an uh, overrun place, but still uh, it is um, recognized, known to people and so on. And we wanted to um, include, you, we can have the next slide. We wanted to include this uh, because on the one hand, it was this passion to do something which is about 50% of our population, which is not so visible. So make something visible, which is not uh, as common in our culture, to talk about things and um, issues which are very, very relevant for our society and give a space to do things. If they would have done a modern museum with uh, modern arts, probably not many people ever would have heard about it. So we wanted to, you to, to think about your society, your community, and do something which is really important for you. And if there is this heart connection, there must be also uh, other places or people who are interested in that. So it's there is not, not a wrong place, not a wrong topic. It's more something, how do you organize it and what does it really mean that it can exist uh, in our society? So this was a kind of like a small inspirational little mm -hmm. museum in, 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 in Hittisau. <laughs> I would like to give the word to Daniela. Yeah, now, Dani, I guess we'll kind of, um, there's there's two unique projects that, um, as you told me, we're involved in. One is the Generative Commons project, and the other one is Agora. And Dani can briefly explain what these are. Yeah, so you, Yilmaz, you, you jump in, and uh, also Bahanur and Jorge, whenever you want, you jump in also with the, with the description of the others. So these are two other projects that we are running at the moment that we would like to share with you to tell you about what we're doing, but also to invite you to contribute. So JECO is a project um, funded by the European Commission on generative commons. So exactly about what we're talking about these days together. And it's uh, a platform um, which at the moment includes uh, mapping uh, what is happening uh, around Europe in terms of urban commons. And I must say, we are very, very um, poor in mapping what is happening in Albania. So I think it would be very interesting if you would like to then, you know, think together about some initiatives that you already have or you're planning on having. So we could have have you on the map of the JECO, of the JECO map in, uh, in the coming year because we will be still working and we're having also some activities such as some uh, uh, webinars, some training. So we're working with the university. The, the, the leader in the, pro in the project is the University of Turin. 
which is the legal de the legal department and it, so it's working on three different aspects one aspect is the legal so the policy framework so identifying a policy framework just as we were discussing to get to, to together today a second package is on digital tools so how can you do for example online mapping online participation models of stakeholders and a third poll that we're more involved is is really actually getting involved the stakeholders so really engaging the people and telling their stories so if you go to the website of jaco we'll put the the, the the websites in the chat now so if you want to take a look it could be very interesting for you to start seeing also for example some of the other videos that are there to telling about the uh, initiatives and we would be very happy to start discussing with you whether there is the possibility of some synergy within the project to start, for example, involving you in this and maybe from this new projects can come out also in the future. Thanks, David, for putting the, the link. Yes, yeah, so you find the link in the chat there. And this brings us to the other project that we have, which is the Agora project, which is a project that is funded by um, the uh, Interreg uh, Danube program. And this means that it involves uh, all uh, the countries that I that you see in the map, um, which uh, um, this could be therefore something that and here you thanks again, David, you see also the link to the to the uh, uh, Agora project. And this again is a is a is a project that is mainly working at the moment with municipalities to help them in identifying a policy framework for urban regeneration temporary uses and therefore once again in a bigger sense um, urban commons so working on policies but also giving municipalities and the local stakeholders just as you're doing now tools to really develop and regenerate heritage in their cities um, and this once again this is a project that started recently uh, i believe it's now six months behind and Horke, correct me if i'm wrong and we will be still working for another two years together approximately so this could be an interesting opportunity to for example again get you on board to tell what you're doing get you to also meet some of the other municipalities that are working in neighboring countries uh, which could be maybe of inspiration once again to you because maybe some of the countries have a similar policy framework or similar culture to what you're doing and therefore could need maybe also give uh, some uh, uh, interesting insight in in terms of this. Tada! So yes, get in touch with us. This is uh, you have our contacts and so on. But I think I believe that this is really the uh, the ambition now is really to to try and use these opportunities of this initial dialogue that we're having. So the meeting today, the meeting next week, but also the opportunities of ongoing projects that we have, and maybe setting up new opportunities also for next year. Maybe, it, you know, it, the idea is really just to have it as a starting uh, opportunity for uh, for working and building uh, new opportunities together. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, I guess that's it from our end in terms of the presentations. Um, we can move on if you have any questions <laughs> or would like to offer feedback or thoughts or perhaps it's inspired something. We're all ears. Uh, so Mira, what did you think? Let's start with you. Any any inspiration? Any ideas? Any thoughts? Yeah, for me it's um, really interesting, and I um, I expressed my um, my comments um, even during the meeting, but uh, other meetings. But uh, I was uh, wondering if. Uh, uh, some of the representatives uh, here can find something, uh, for example, Ina, who find uh, um, Kash Rocafe, Kashina Rocafe as one interesting point, or uh, with Floretta that we um, uh, discussed something about the uh, cultural center. So I wanted to... Um, them to, to speak before and then. Okay, first, thanks for the presentation. It was very interesting uh, knowing the development of the old buildings, let's say, and uh, they are changing in something so interesting and uh, very, let's say, uh, let's say uh, uh, develop, developing uh, for the, the cities that uh, have uh, uh, these projects. Well, I find uh, 
about the municipality of Cavaya something uh, communities. One was the Cascina uh, Roca Franca, and the second was uh, Farga Fabrican. We are a city that we have uh, many fabrics, but uh, they aren't in use anymore. And why not to, uh, to revital revitalize them in uh, doing something for the community? So uh, about Cascina Roca Franca, I was uh, seeing a little about the activities that is culture and uh, it's, uh, it's very interesting to maybe uh, develop the, the culture in my city with this kind of uh, uh, commons with uh, Roca Franca uh, Cascina. But uh, what I was asking about uh, this, it's uh, uh, Cascina Roca Franca, it's more uh, a public, let's say, uh, place or it's more e e uh, included with uh, private or NGOs or uh, I don't know, uh, something like it's more uh, a public entity or it's uh, development for, for organization, private, uh, local uh, uh, artists, I don't know, something like that. Because for us, it's a little problem to bring uh, the, the culture in uh, uh, in theater, for example, uh, everyone is uh, focused in, the, uh, in uh, the capital, which is Tirana. It has the most uh, theaters of the city. Uh, for example, my municipality doesn't have a theater, so even the students that go to study for art, they prefer to stay, let's say, in Tirana and to, to, to get, uh, to get uh, their profession there. Uh, I was thinking, how can I bring them, these students, or maybe even the artists who, who now are confirmed artists in uh, in uh, doing something like Cascina Roca Franca as a municipality, always talking as a municipality. Okay, that's thanks. Tina. That's a very very interesting uh, point you're making. I mean, how how what is the role of the municipality to enable these processes? That's uh, that's a, that's, a, that's a very challenging one. Um, in the case of Turin, the municipality is the one that uh, owns and manages in large part the, the, the space. As we were saying, it's managed by a foundation, but the foundation is, is predominantly uh, the shares of the foundation. I don't know if they're called shares, but anyway, the, the foundation is predominantly um, represented by the municipality. So the municipality has a very strong role. This is also something that is cultural in Turin. Turin historically has, it was the first capital of Italy. It has a very strong um, uh, role of the public administration. Um, so all initiatives, all cultural initiatives usually are anyway very uh, supported by the municipality. This is not always the case, but as I see that you are willing as a municipality to do this, I would say that this in the case of Turin, and this I think also then Bahanur and, and Gilmatz can definitely jump into this because I think then in terms of uh, supporting the cultural sector, they're very experienced. The fact that the municipality creates a space is the opportunity for them having a, a box, let's say, where you can have activities happening. So having the possibility of having a cultural sector where the municipality maybe owns the space and co-managers allows that there is the economic sustainability for the space to be running. In the case of Cascina Rocca Franca, though, the foundation is also represented by the NGOs of the, of the neighborhood. And this means that they mainly don't put money in, they put their time and their ideas. And this means that then they are maybe active also in, in uh, setting up projects. And one of the things that I think is very strong in Cascina Rocca Franca is that they, they organize lots a lot of events. So they have the problem. They don't have the problem so much with um, uh, other cities because Turin anyway is a big city that has a lot of cultural activities, but the cultural activities are in the city center. In Mirafiori, which is on the outside, it's a periphery of the city, there's not so much cultural activity. So to get good cultural activities, they really have to make it interesting. And this is where the municipality also has a good communication machine. You know, if they want to, you know, support events and festivals that can be interesting. And maybe this could be something to start thinking of is if you have the possibility of having a space, maybe an old industry that is regenerated into a cultural space, 
getting NGOs on board as well, having a program of events is fundamental to maybe make it interesting also for people from Tirana, because I could imagine, but I don't know the, the scene so well, but probably in Tirana, it's much more competitive for smaller uh, theater companies or for more, smaller, crea younger creatives to get space because there's so much competition. So it could be interesting for them to maybe experiment and in, in, in your space, because maybe this, this is an opportunity for building up something new. Uh, but I don't know what maybe Hilmats and Bahanur might have also some also additional ideas on this. I, I mean, um, I think the main issue, this, this is, yeah, like you said, Dani, this is a, a larger issue that um, we could probably devote a whole workshop on to developing. Um, but I think, you know, uh, we have to be clear about the stakeholders. We have to be clear about the, the various entities that are involved in this and what their roles are and um, how, uh, what the policies are that will support this and also what the financial and governance structure could be. Um, you know, cause we've seen a whole bunch of different examples um, in, the, in the presentation. So, I mean, I, I really can't say much without um, spending more time on the case itself and on the location itself. But um, I think that arts is a good way. And especially if you combine it with some commercial activities as well and involve NGOs as well. I think that might be a unique way of making use. But then, you know, there's also the building and the cost of maintaining and um, rejuvenating the building. So those are also other issues that need to be considered. That's what comes off the top of my head. So, um, Ina, at the moment, the municipality, for example, are you having some specific programs for regenerating some target neighborhoods, maybe of the old industrial areas that you were talking about? Yeah, we have, uh, but uh, regenerating the neighborhoods, first it's uh, about the viewing of the, of the neighborhood, about the, um, uh, the facade of the buildings to redecorate them because they, uh, they are a little uh, old in, 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 the, in the walls, let's say. Then for the spaces between the, the neighborhoods to putting uh, um, uh, spaces for children, like uh, small activities uh, in playing them during the, the, the time, uh, building something like, uh, I don't know, space for uh, parking the, the cars or uh, uh, the one else is may, maybe a, a small a small park with uh, trees and something very very small but uh, what I was uh, seeing is, is for example in the neighborhoods it's very interesting to having a common cafe because everyone from the neighborhoods go in the center of the city and drink cafe in that uh, uh, cafe that is built there so uh, to having a market, to having a market, to having a cafe, to having a, a library, for example, to having something, uh, I don't know, that the, all the neighborhood can center there and can, can uh, uh, spend their time uh, in their neighborhood by, by uh, doing all these things so, so the neighborhood isn't so, so, so weak in, in, in having, uh, uh, let's say, uh, life. The life in the neighborhood is very weak. It's all totally about concerting in the center. So the center is, for example, now that is the time of Christmas and the New Year, all the center is decorating and the neighborhoods are with no lights. That, that means that the focus of the municipality is more in the center. Um, we have uh, very large neighborhoods, even, uh, let's say, uh, I, I can't uh, describe the rural uh, rural uh, spaces that are very, uh, I don't know what, uh, uh, they, they are not so uh, developed as the, as the city, but I can say that uh, uh, there are some uh, big neighborhoods that I can, uh, I can uh, propose the, the, uh, the, the two, the two projects that was the uh, Roca Franca and the neighborhood that has near the uh, the fabric of we have to use it for the paper that produced paper. The building is existent; it's in the good uh, good construction, but uh, it's not available for nothing. It's just closed, and it's a public uh, property. So we it's let's say in the hands of the municipality if if it has a, a funds and project and uh, collaborations, uh, even if it takes the idea, for example, the fabricant, uh, the FARC fabricant, sorry, it's, um, it's an idea that is just, let's say, to 
to copy and to bring in in Cavaya. It's so like easy because the uh, uh, Cascina Rocca Franca it would, would be a little um, um, uh, state with the the culture of the city. What is our preferences? Not everything, for example, that is in the Cascina Franca we we could uh, adopt in in Cavaya. But we can uh, we can uh, make the comments uh, alterated with our culture. I think one thing that the Fag Fabrican has going for it is that Stockholm itself is um, very kind of, let's say, artistically production heavy place um, with also a lot of urban uh, development issues. And um, it was even for uh, architecture exhibitions. So it was very interesting that part yeah. to make even the conferences or to, to, to yeah. bring the, all the communities what we can change about the city to talk to have ideas and this we can integrate and it's very interesting yeah 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 i agree it would be very unique and then uh, it would also benefit the community absolutely especially if you introduce like you said the social businesses like the cafe or a few other little um uh, or, or even market uh, you know have a market uh, on the weekends or something to just invigorate the, the neighborhood and, and the community and get them more involved would be quite interesting. I don't know if there are any comments also from the others, if you, if you have some, also some questions to clarify some of the stories, because obviously we try to keep it short, so you might have some curiosity around some of the other cases as well. And you could also speak in Albanian, I'm sure, uh, uh, the others won't mind uh, helping in the translation if you feel more comfortable. Okay, so maybe what we... Uh, Sorry. Since, mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, Daniela. Um, since um, maybe the others uh, um, even don't remind some of the uh, activities or some of the um, possibilities that you gave, uh, I followed the... Um, um, your website and your um, Facebook uh, and uh, mostly the last two um, projects with uh, Agora and uh, Go Echo and um, uh, uh, they were uh, really interested and uh, since uh, all the partners that are here has uh, projects with uh, within Interreg Durus municipality has project with Interreg, uh, Durus region, um, prefecture of Durus uh, and Kavaya, and also um, um, Albanian railway uh, in different topics uh, with different questions. Um, and they are, maybe they have finished or they are in ongoing uh, Interreg projects within uh, Italy and uh, Albania and uh, in the region. Um, they are well known with, uh, with some of, uh, of the uh, guidelines and uh, with some of the um, practices in uh, Interreg uh, and in international um, project, but um, we are really interested, as you said, uh, if uh, our um, our stakeholders that are present here or our institutions can be a part of this, uh, maybe conferences, trainings, or uh, our good practices uh, be inside your uh, your link or uh, your uh, big uh, big map of uh, of these uh, examples. Uh, for example, as you said, uh, I, I, I want to mention the, the, uh, the support that the uh, municipality gave, uh, especially our NGO to build the, the um, to reconstruct the youth center. So uh, this is a good example that can be uh, in. And this is ecologically because uh, the, the idea and the way that uh, is reconstructed and is rebuilt it is uh, uh, eco-friendly. Uh, there are also other uh, institutions uh, um, made possible from municipality. Uh, for example, another um, multifunctional youth center uh, that is uh, in um, um, in Schozet, 
uh, for Roma and Egyptian uh, uh, youths uh, that is also supported from the from Durus municipality. But it's also uh, um, a partnership, as you said, you have to to uh, uh, to have on board a lot of stakeholders, and they are donors, uh, stakeholders. They are uh, um, it's a um, municipality. There are also uh, international, um, not only donors, but international NGOs uh, working there. Is the community of Roma and Egyptian? Uh, is the school? that is uh, there. Uh, also, um, some other um, stakeholders that all together create these good examples that uh, um, it's better even for us when we, um, we share our experiences and uh, we say, okay, uh, um, for example, Doris had this uh, bad opportunity of earthquake and uh, then uh, we are still in the phase of uh, rebuilding, but we have some good examples and this gives us uh, um, a good chance to rebuild and to continue. Uh, when you were asking to Ina about uh, what they think for the future, um, they are now just rebuilding some, uh, um, um, some houses and uh, some some other buildings that were destroyed from the earthquake and all the budget and all the money till now in most of the of the municipalities were directed and i'm talking about duras shiak and kavaya were directed to the earthquake uh, uh, to revitalize the 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 life af after that but now it's time that we have to to think about the future based on some good examples that we have with the support of these other new examples or uh, these, um, uh, these uh, uh, good practices that uh, we can fi fit uh, really good to, to each other. So um, the, the last two, two projects, uh, I was wondering if uh, if uh, we can be part or we, if we can have uh, more information or just to uh, say specifically what kind of information you need to, to, uh, to put us part of these uh, links. And also uh, why not to, um, um, to organize then uh, a common project uh, with uh, your support, with your help or lead it by you uh, in the way that how it has to be, and then um, we can apply for for funds uh, to uh, to make it uh, as much as possible. For example, I remember the good example of uh, uh, the second um, one. Um, I think it was in Bratislava that after five years it becomes self uh, sufficient. So. Um, Okay, it's a long time, let's say, but it's not a long time, five years, because uh, going uh, slowly, you can uh, learn and uh, you can uh, see the results year after year. Or, for example, the other um, example that uh, since we are in uh, really poor economically was, uh, I guess it was the case of Lisbona that is working still with uh, uh, European uh, programs, financial programs. I don't know uh, which of which of them were exactly still working with the programs of uh, EU funds. So uh, these examples gave us um, uh, an idea and uh, um, let's say a green light that uh, uh, we can work even in this uh, direction uh, just uh, uh, well thought and well uh, managed to, to do as uh, it, uh, it's uh, the right uh, uh, way to, 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 to think and to realize that. Oh, thanks, Mira. I think for um, for the ongoing projects, 
we are planning activities for the early 2020 in both of the of the projects so i think it, it will be all online uh, for the moment because this is a situation so it makes it even easier to say you know join us and tell us also what you're doing and i think that would be very interesting um so this is something that then we can we can we don't have dates exactly so we're working on it and i think this is something that with the with Yilmaz and the rest of the team, we can absolutely work on and that would be really, really nice. So we can, early next year, early January, we can send you more information. So I think it could be two types of things. The first would be joining one of a webinar, a bit like this. We have them sort of public that then are streamed on Facebook and you could share uh, the work that you're doing. Maybe you could join some of the internal workshops, which those that you think are more interesting and relevant also for the work that you're doing, you know, Mira, Lina and the others. Um, and on the basis of that, for example, then we can write, you know, maybe some article or something like this. So I think this could be something that we could uh, absolutely do for early 2021. Um, and in terms of getting new projects, I think yes, and I think maybe this is where we can use and there will be a few words now for the workshop also that we're having next Monday. We could use next Monday as the beginning of starting to think a little bit about what it could be that we try to um, apply for. Um, we have to find the right program where, uh, because I was seeing that on the Interreg Italy Albania is for the south of Italy, so it's for Puglia. So we have an organization also in Italy, but it's in Rome. But we can think about this. We work a lot with the city of Bari. Um, so, for example, we could think, and Bari is doing very interesting stuff in terms of commons. So maybe we could think of doing something together also with them. We didn't speak to you about Bari today, but we work a lot with them. So that could be also something that we, there could be maybe some exchange uh, we could try. So I would say let's keep our eyes open for uh, for also funding opportunities, and it could be it could be absolutely something really really nice. And I think this brings us then to the next point, which will be, correct me if I'm wrong, Neil Mats, there's a few words also about the workshop next Monday, is that correct? Yeah? Yes, yes. About the, the, the time, uh, I guess that um, mm. uh, one o'clock, um, I don't know if, uh, because uh, some of the persons uh, uh, asked if we can postpone on 22. So on Thursday, but if uh, most uh, of the participants uh, agree or um, uh, if we can make it uh, around 11 on uh, 20 uh, on Monday at 11 o'clock, we will have to um, or you I, don't have scheduled. We, I don't have my schedule in front of me. Uh -huh. I think we'll, we'll all have to take a look to see what's possible. I do recall that it was Thursday, and then you requested that we shift it to Monday. Yes. Um, and then we shifted it to Monday, and we agreed upon that time. But let's see if we can readjust that. Um, I don't know what our schedules are right now. I guess we'll have to take a look at it. And after this, we can discuss. Um, uh, as I remember, it's uh, always at 1 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe so, yes. Yes, or it's it at, at 11.30. Um, I'll have to take a look. but Just, um, just to be sure, because um, I couldn't yeah. find the, the final version. I, I emailed it, but um, I, I that's something we'll have to take a look. But um, anyways, let's move on and let's talk about what it entails, mm -hmm. because um, we're preparing a game. And um, who would like to briefly kind of brief us on, on what we'll be doing on Monday? Um, Giovanni or Jorge? Jorge is not present. Maybe yeah. Giovanni. Giovanni can help out. Hello, everyone. Yeah, uh, for Monday, and then I, we actually need to share to yeah, to find out some more things. But we are we are preparing a sort of a, a, a board game, a sort of a game that would be done, a sort of a, a collaborative planning project that will take and it take into consideration some of the cases that we presented today and taking some function actions or approach and bring them together in a collaborative way and develop something together. We are still working on it and we will be ready for Monday, but we kind of need that to know the number of participants and who is participating to that and their, where they come from, if they're an NGO, if they're municipalities or other public authorities, so we can incorporate them also in the game. 
Great. I think it's going to be very interesting because um, I've played these games and um, they really provide a unique perspective into, into these issues. Um, they allow you to look at it from a different angle and you role play kind of as well. So, you know, you have a different, you kind of put yourself in the shoes of other stakeholders and how they would be thinking. And um, so it, it is very beneficial. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. Um, we'll, I guess we'll, we'll um, get in touch in regards to the times. So I'll take a look at the schedules and uh, Mira, I'll write to you. I, like I said, right now, I don't have all the information in front of me, but afterwards um, we can take a look. Um, is, is there anything else anyone, anyone would like to add or contribute or say? Okay. All right, well, I, uh, yes. Only, just, only one thing, if everyone is, who is participating today would also participate on Monday or there will be someone else. So you'd like to know the full list of participants so we can develop yeah. the game accordingly. Okay. Yeah, um, I can, I can share here, maybe uh, Google Drive, they, they can write down the, the, their name and where they come from. Or sure. maybe I can share you by email, you can send them to hold. Yeah. What do you prefer, email? Um, I, I think that let's do it through David. Let's, um, why don't you send him a list of what you need and he'll organize it so we can extract that information from the, from the duress folk. Um, uh, by the way, the workshop was scheduled for um, uh, Monday, December 21st at 1230, from 1230 to 2. 1230 two. till two. 2. Yeah. Okay. Is that okay? Is that doable? Um, I will... Thirty. Okay. 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 All right. So, if um, uh, yeah, I guess if there's uh, not much more, um, we hope this has been beneficial and helpful. Um, we're definitely uh, looking forward to hopefully developing future. Um, concepts and projects and um, um, collaborating even more. And we're looking forward to the workshop on Monday. It'll be a um, fun game to play. <laughs> okay. And um, David David will contact you, Mira, in regards to the okay. information that we need to extract so we can develop the game and um, customize it for this, for this situation. Okay. Yes. I add one thing for the game, just for also the participants to know, um, adding to what we would, it would be useful for us to know who is participating so we know how many people and more or less what type of profiles and the other thing is um so that you know it would be very useful if you could connect with your computers and not your mobile phone because we will be using a platform called miro um so that that uh, it, it's it's very simple no no technological complications but for mobile phone it would be very difficult for you to interact so if possible, please connect up with your computer so that way then you can, you know, speak and and play with us in the very simple and hopefully very useful and fun game to, to be working on together. Okay, most of the participants uh, are from um, uh, from local government, region, prefecture and municipality. One is media and uh, two plus me, so three from NGO. If uh, it's needed to, um, also uh, one for, uh, another stakeholder, uh, Anita, that is writing here, uh, it's another uh, railway, but uh, it's always, um, uh, it's something between state and, uh, it's half state and half self-managed. Uh, 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 so, um, these are more or less the the participants or the number of uh, participants or the profile of them okay great well um i don't know I, if it's help, uh, this helps well, well, uh, it, it i guess it does help definitely giovanni um i guess it would help more if um, when david sent you specific questions in regards to this if we can get the full data from you um in regards to the questions and this way i i, I guess it would be even more beneficial for giovanni and jorge to customize the game um, but I think that's a good good start, and uh, David will be forwarding you the questions um, um, shortly, so that so that we can get the exact details. Okay, well, thank Girl, you so it was much. Lovely to see you today. See you next week. Thanks a yeah. lot, yeah, and we look forward you. to seeing you again next week.
Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.